The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Let's take our Bibles, if you would, and open them to Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26. In our study of the tabernacle this afternoon, we continue our discussion of the foundation of the tent. Now, we, we don't often think of foundations needing a tent, but the tabernacle did, in fact, need one because it was such a, a massive structure in weight, not very big uh, overall, but it was a, a very heavy structure. And I'll, I'll show you this picture again for, that we showed last week. This, this shows the framework of the tabernacle with the uh, this is before the coverings are put on. And these are boards that are made of acacia wood. They make up the framework and these boards are overlaid with gold. And on top of this frame, there are four heavy coverings, one of linen, one of goat skins, another of ram skins. And then the last one to go on was a covering of badger skins. And to enable these boards to stand, they were interlocked at the bottom with two foundation pieces that were called sockets, and these were made of silver. And as we discussed last time, these sockets weighed nearly 100 pounds each, and that made the weight of the foundation by itself about five tons. So you take the heavy wood that's on top of that, the heavy coverings and the gold on the boards, and, and that was all put on the sockets of silver, and that made the tabernacle a substantial structure, a tent like any that you've ever seen. Each year at the Shepherds Conference, there is a massive tent that's erected in the parking lot. And this is where they uh, serve the food and they sell books. And uh, this tent is held up by large poles, much, much larger than the tabernacle, but it doesn't have the weight of the tabernacle. So that's a typical tent where you wouldn't see a foundation underneath of it. But as I said, because of all this weight that's there, uh, this foundation is what holds up the tabernacle. It does require a foundation and that uh, kept the tabernacle strong and being beaten by the desert winds that would blow it over. Now, if you look at our text in Exodus 26, we're not going to read all of these verses. We, we did read these last week. And we find here that it describes part of the coverings of the, and the boards. And, and if you look at verses 18 20 through 25, there is a mention of the sockets that make up the foundation underneath these boards. In verse number 19, it says, And thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. Now that, that would be typical as you go around the tabernacle, each of the boards on all sides have underneath them two sockets of silver. And on these 48 boards, there was a protrusion that was made at the end of the board called a tenon, and that sat down into the sockets and locked it in that held the boards in place. And again, that's what made the tabernacle sturdy and kept it from being uh, blown over by the winds. Now, our concern, though, this evening is the material that these sockets were made of. They're made of silver. Silver is a very important metal in the scriptures. It's a foundation of silver. And what we've learned in past studies, and as we see in many places in the Bible, that silver typifies redemption. And the picture that we have here is that our salvation, our redemption, uh, of our souls was bought and paid for by the death of Christ on the cross. That silver stands for the redemption of Christ. And since the days of the tabernacle and then going on through the uh, both Testaments, silver speaks of this redemption. And our subject this afternoon is redemption typified by silver in this foundation of the tabernacle. Now, if you were here with us last time, our first observation about the foundation it was the amount of redemption. That is, the amount that was brought as the redemption price by all of the children of Israel in the wilderness as uh, they begin their worship of God during this 40 years that they travel with the tabernacle. And uh, in Exodus chapter 30, the amount that they were to bring is specified as a half shekel. In 
Uh, Exodus 30, verse 11 through 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is twenty geras, a half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Now we notice in the text that this is a ransom that is paid for the soul. That, of course, is emblematic of redemption, the price of redemption that Christ paid when he offered himself as a sacrifice for sin. But what I want you to remember as we, as we talk about these different elements of the tabernacle, these things are typical. It's not the actual purchase of redemption that a person could pay for himself. That would be impossible. But it's all emblematic. This is a symbol of the true redemption that is only paid by Christ. And we noted that the redemption price is paid only by the men. If you remember, this is where we, uh, what we talked about last week. Only the men pay this redemption price. And my man back there on the, there you go, hit the button. It's paid by every man. Paid by every man. Exodus 30. And you might open, I, I, I didn't note this, I don't think. So if you'll open to Exodus 30 there, you'll see this in verse number 12. Uh, when thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. So every man who was above the age of 20 years old was to bring the price of redemption. And these are men that were taught. These are men that would be cognizant of the reason the money is brought. These are men that would recognize the significance of the price paid. These are men that would typically be head of families. Now the inclusion of all males, where the scripture says that all the men are to bring this redemption price, is to show us that all men are sinners and every man needs redemption. This is why all are required to bring it. Now you understand, as we said last week, that the Bible doesn't teach that only men are sinners. That's a very generic thing. Women are sinners too. We pointed that out last week. Women are sinners too. But the male is the one who is representative. The man is typical of humanity. And that's represented, of course, in the first man, Adam. When, when Eve ate of the fruit of the garden, it wasn't Eve that God charged with the sin. It was Adam. Adam ate and Adam was responsible. And it's through Adam that we receive our sinful nature. And I hope you understand that that is the reason that Christ needed to be born of a virgin so that the sin nature of Adam would not be passed on to Jesus. But as we look at these kinds of things that we see in the tabernacle, there, there are folks that, that don't believe in inherent depravity. There are some who don't believe that a person becomes a sinner until he actually sins. And so there are some that deny the doctrine of original sin. But when you do that, you have to contend with, with scriptures and these types and figures that we have in the Old Testament. These are things that have to be dealt with because these very things are confirmed by the antitype that we find in the New Testament. So something has to be done with all of this typology to make the scriptures fit together, together to give us a, a comprehensive understanding of redemption and the necessity that, uh, for our redemption. Why is there a virgin birth? Why was there one if it was not to prevent the inherent sin in man's nature and his depravity of being passed to Jesus? If we don't become sinners until we sin, then Jesus could have been born as all people are born. He could have avoided sin through the spirit that was in him. He could have gone ahead and lived the perfect life that he lived and still could have earned righteousness that he would impute to us. But this doctrine is, as many others in Scripture, people don't really understand the systematics of Bible doctrine, and so they run into dead ends and their doctrines conflict. And so we learn in this typology that every person is a sinner, that even before we sin, we already have the pedigree. The man in Scripture is representative of all people, and especially in this instance, it's the man who is responsible for his family. This is why you see the heads of households that are bringing the redemption money. 
So the redemption money stands good as being representative of the price that was paid for the ones that are under the man's care. Well, that, that catches us up with last week's lesson. And so now I want us to move into the second observation about this amount of redemption. And secondly, is that it's paid equally by men. It's paid equally. In Exodus 30 again, verse number 14, everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. There we see that the amount paid is precisely the same for each man. The price established in Exodus 30 is a half a shekel. The poor didn't bring less. The rich didn't bring more. And the amount that it's brought, it's not so excessive that the poor couldn't pay it. It needs to be within the reach of every man. And so in, in today's dollars, we would be looking at something like less than a dollar for every person. So the typology that we have here is not to indicate that the redemption that was paid by Christ it was of so little value, while in fact it was of infinite value. And this doesn't speak to the value of Christ's blood, but it speaks to the value of man's contribution to redemption. In other words, no matter who you are and no matter how much you have, your personal wealth does not figure into the redemption of your soul. And so this equal amount that's paid by everyone is to let everyone know that there is none who stands higher or lower in God's eyes, depending upon social status or any other qualifier, that when the redeemed stand before God, the multitudes of people that will be there come from all different economic classes of all kindreds and tongues, with no distinction between them because one is better than another. Now, of course, you know, I think that the Jews of Jesus' time were convinced that a person's economic standard had much to do with his acceptance with God. To be rich meant that you had God's favor. And when you get into God's kingdom, this would mean a higher position for you because God had so highly favored, had highly favored you. And so uh, the thought in the rich person's mind was, uh, they thought so highly of themselves that it was common to act condescendingly towards those that were poor. And that's an attitude that still shows up today because uh, we tend to look down on those who have less than we do. Our human nature doesn't let us think that the homeless guy that stands on the street with a cardboard sign is as valuable a soul as a person who lives in a gated community. And because that was such a problem for the church, I mean, this is the social, the more of the time, this is what they thought, uh, and the church had to endure this, that we find in the book of James, that James taught that we are not to respect the rich person who comes into our worship any more than the poor man. So James explains that we don't take the rich man who comes into the church and bring him down to the best seat at the front, recognize him, and then push the poor people into the back of the church. Now, one of the doctrines that's taught here is that God is not a respecter of persons, that God sees nothing in you that makes you more worthy or less worthy of redemption. I mean, the simple fact here, the underlying fact is that none are worthy. None of us are worthy of our salvation. Our worth is only established as we are in Christ. He's the one that makes us worthy to God. And so it's only as we are in Christ that we even have any kind of worth whatsoever that we would be able to enter into God's presence. And this is the critical factor in why you must know Jesus Christ. You must be a believer in him before you can approach God in any way, even in your prayers. God has no regard for the prayers of people that aren't his own because they don't understand Christ. They're not in Christ. And the church is so often guilty of this, is making these distinctions in people uh, pragmatism says that we must have at least enough number in the church, enough people in the church that do have substantial income so they can support the work of the church and get the gospel out. That's common. God knows that that would be necessary. We can't deny that that's true to some degree. And that's not unusual because God has a plan of finance, of finance for the church. God will work all of that out in order for the church to be sustained. I remember... Uh, a few years ago, speaking to Jim Kinese, who was our former missionary to, to Hunger, Hungary, and uh, he was uh, 
witnessing to people on streets in Budapest. And uh, he told me that it would be really, really easy for him to fill the church up with homeless people because one of the outreach programs the church has had was to have meals in their homes and they would invite church members to come into their home to, to eat. That, that's where he got the term munchies for his missionary reports. Remember that? He called each of them a munchie and each one of them, one of them had a food theme to it. And that's because this is one of their outreach programs. They always had people in their home to eat. So he said, it would be real easy for me to fill up our church with homeless people because everybody wants a meal. But Jim also admitted that if the church was filled up with homeless people, then all he would have would be a homeless ministry. And that wasn't conducive to building a church that would be self-supporting. And so it wasn't his purpose then to target the homeless. It's known, it's a known fact that before people have their hearts changed, they won't necessarily go to a church that has people of unequal economic status. So what we have to look at when we understand all of these things, we must be very careful about this balance. We do need people in the church that can support the ministry, but we also need the poor on the other end of that as well and minister to them. What we can't do is believe that there are some who are undesirable converts. There is no such thing as an undesirable convert. We reach people with Christ, we see them saved, we rejoice in their salvation no matter what economic class that they're in. So if we, if we, if we do anything less than that, then we deny the scripture's teaching that none of us are more worthy than another, or there are some of us who deserve God's grace. Merited grace is an oxymoron. Now, another interesting aspect of this half shekel is that the priests knew that the price paid was enough. God requires a just weight and a fair balance. And so the priest would very carefully examine what was brought. He wouldn't accept silver that was unrefined, silver mixed with dross, and neither would he take less than what was required. Now, there's another teaching in that which shows that God is very specific about salvation. He accepts only one payment. It's not the payment that I decide. It's not my payment or your payment. It's not any of our worthless efforts that we bring to God. He accepts only what Christ did. Only what Christ did. So the price of redemption, the only thing that God will accept is the death of Christ that is represented by the shedding of his blood. And that old beloved song we sang this morning, Rock of Ages, Augustus Top Lady expressed it well. This is a, a verse that, a couple of verses here that don't always match what you see in modern hymnals. But he wrote, Not the labor of mine hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All could never sin erase. Thou must save and save by grace. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked, come to thee for dress, helpless, look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Did you hear? Nothing in my hands I bring. Now the redemption price doesn't mean that anyone can pay for his salvation, not that anyone can offer anything to God for him. It means, and it's trying to show us here that all of us, stand on equal footing before God. There is none deserving. There is none that merits grace, but all may receive grace. Now, going on, there is the amount of redemption, and then next there is the application of redemption. When the tabernacle was finished and standing in its place at the center of the camp, each man that approached could affirm that his redemption price was paid. The half shekel was collected from all of the men. It was melted down and formed into the foundation. It makes the tabernacle foundation and the tabernacle stands on the price that is paid. So the man whose redemption was paid, this means that now he has part and lot in the worship of God. What does this teach? Well, uh, it is in fact some of the marvelous doctrine that is central to the doctrine of Berean Baptist Church. First of all, it teaches that the payment is personal. That this is a payment that is made for him. This is not a payment that's made for others. Each man 
presented himself to the priest. He has his own piece of ransom money. And so the individual must go to the priest and, and cast in his lot to be counted among those that were represented. When Jesus preached to the crowds in Capernaum, he said in John 6, 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Eating and drinking are very personal. You can't eat or drink for someone else. Ever tried that? You can't eat or drink for someone else. So sometimes I wish that someone could eat for me and then I wouldn't have to worry about gaining too much weight so I couldn't fit in my suit. Uh, that might be good. Um, but, I, you know, I've seen some Baptist preachers, though, that look like they've been eating for others as well as for themselves. And uh, they, can't, they can't see their shoes. They can't get to their belt without digging in the overlap, and that is kind of a problem. But it, it, would, it might be nice if you could uh, eat, for, eat for someone, but, but you can't. I have to eat for myself to live. I can't take care of that for you, and you can't take care of it for me. And so it is with our salvation that there is nothing that I can do for you that will help you to pay for any part of your sins. And there's nothing that you can do for me that will help me to pay for any of my sins. So I can't go to a priest and say to him, would you put this to the account of one of my dead relatives? Help, help get them out of purgatory. Help satisfy something that they've done wrong. Just let me pay this price. You can't do that. Psalm 49, verses 6 and 7. They that trust in their wealth and boast, them, boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give God a ransom for him. So a man is never asked to bring a half shekel for anyone other than himself. Secondly, the payment was for their purchase. When they brought the money... They were sure that it accomplished exactly what it was designed to do. It purchased their representation, and that means that their place is secured. So if you didn't pay the money, then you don't have part in the tabernacle. You can't be counted among those that the priests would offer sacrifices for. Now that should be very clear to us that re the redemption price is paid for the individual. It's not paid for anyone else. Uh, there were plenty of Moabites that lived around. There were plenty of Amorites. There were plenty of other Canaanites. Plenty of the other ites, you might say, who were living in, in the areas around the tabernacle. But there wasn't any price that was paid for them. They have no redemption money in the tabernacle. And so what happens if there is no money paid? Well, then the person has no right. He has no fellowship. He's an outcast. He dared not approach the tabernacle and if he wasn't represented there. So he paid a price that had an exact corresponding benefit as he brought the money. Well, what does that teach? It teaches that the death of Christ truly redeems, that it does pay the price. So you ask the question, for whom is that price paid? It's paid for the believer. The believer is represented by this Israelite to obey to bring the redemption money. There isn't anybody outside of the camp that has a redemption price that's paid for him. So it would be foolishness to say the tabernacle stood on a foundation that wasn't really there. If the half shekel is not there, then where is the foundation? So what you have is real money that's paid, that is a real price that pays for a real foundation. It does exactly what's intended to do. And do you understand that the Berean Baptist Church is one of the few Baptist churches that still believes that blessed truth of Bible doctrine? We believe that there are none that are redeemed except those whose price was paid, and all whose price was paid are all redeemed. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10, 15, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and lay down my life for the sheep. John 17, 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. John 17, 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I think all of you are familiar with those scriptures. What do they teach? They teach particular redemption. The tabernacle teaches particular redemption. Jesus taught particular redemption. Further, he says in Matthew 25 
And before him, just as Jesus, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left hand. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, listen, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now there we see a separation between sheep and goats. For whom is the kingdom prepared? It's prepared for the sheep, not the goats. Sheep are sheep. Goats are goats. I've never heard of a goat that became a sheep. And I've never heard of a sheep that became a goat. So the redemption price paid by Christ was for his sheep. He said, these are the ones who hear me. These are the ones that follow me. And he says, these are the ones that I give eternal life. So Christ did not give his blood to pay a ransom price for people that are in hell. If he did, they wouldn't be there. His price truly redeems. As surely as an Israelite that brought the redemption money secured representation at the tabernacle. Now as an example of this, and to show you how scripture fits together on this point, the Old Testament certainly teaches the same thing. And this is why one of the reasons that as we go through the tabernacle, we bring these things out that have an antitype filled to the New Testament. So you can expect that the Old Testament is going to be cohesive on this very subject. So to give you an example of this, you remember the story of David when he decided to number the children of Israel. In the scriptures that we've read, the, the Lord said that when the people are numbered, uh, we read uh, most of this last week, but when the people are numbered, there is a ransom that must be paid. Uh, what, what God said, there can't be a numbering of the people without redemption money. And if they numbered the people without redemption money, then they would be killed in a plague. Now, I don't have time to read the whole story tonight, but David decided that he would number the people without taking redemption money. That, that story is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 24. You can uh, read that later if you like. But in his pride, David numbered the people. And when he did, he counted among the number. There were some people from Tyre. There were some Hivites that he numbered with Israel. There were other Canaanites that he numbered with Israel. And that would never have been possible if David had demanded a ransom price, the half shekel to be paid. Because only Israelites, only those that had part in the tabernacle could pay that price. And because David numbered the people, there were 70,000 in Israel that were killed. What is the point of that story? The point is that it's only God's numbered that can be counted. Redemption applies only to those who are actually numbered among God's people. And only God's people have their redemption price paid. So when the children of Israel brought their redemption money, their place was assured. They could come to the tabernacle and they look at that foundation with silver of silver and they say, my money is there. My representation is there. My redemption has been paid. And friend, if your redemption is paid, you'll not fail to be in heaven. Can you imagine that there would be one person that the redemption price was paid for him and he doesn't get to heaven? That'd be like having a tabernacle with pieces of the foundation missing. There would be a defect in the very foundations of heaven itself if that was true. Two things are taught by this. First, that the salvation of every soul is secure. If you are saved, you will be in heaven because your redemption is paid. There is no, no such thing as having a part of the foundation torn away because you didn't make it. Then secondly, as stated before, the foundation blocks are made up of only those for whom a payment has been made. There, there are no persons without a payment, or ever will be, that, don't have their, that have their sins paid for. And so to say that Christ paid the sins of anyone who's not in heaven is to say the foundation is no good, that it's parts that are missing, and so the entire structure is unstable. So if you look at it this way, if you took the tabernacle and you remove one of the sockets, or if you remove many of the sockets under many of the boards, how does the tabernacle any longer stand? Now, let me tell you, the redemption price paid by Christ is not unstable. The work that Christ did is not unstable. He did what he came to do. 
The angel said, call his name Jesus for what? He shall save his people from their sins. Call his name Savior because that's what he does. He never fails to save his people and only his people. Well, I could go on and on with that, and I have before. As I said, this doctrine stands at the core of what we teach about salvation. We say, we believe that we are historical Baptists, and that means that we stand on what the Old Testament and New Testaments teach about salvation in Jesus Christ. So we have the amount of redemption, there's the application of redemption. Now, lastly, is the accomplishment of redemption. The redemption money alone would be insufficient to teach all of the object lessons that are intended without uh, considering the whole of tabernacle worship. It'd be impossible to isolate one incident and say, well, all we ever need to know about this, all we ever need to know about salvation is represented by redemption money. No, there's other pictures of the tabernacle. All of it has to be brought into focus. All of it applies as you bring the whole picture of the tabernacle together. But it's amazing how that people want to interpret the Bible without considering all of it. And so what they'll do is build theological systems on one or two or three or four passages of Scripture as if that's the only thing the Bible has to say on the subject. So they anchor their doctrines in one or two places of Scripture without taking the whole. And the truth of the matter is, if you're going to read John 3.16 and believe John 3.16, then you've also got to consider John chapter 6. And you better know John chapter 10. And you also better know John chapter 17. And you also need to know what it says in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. And you need to know what it says in Romans 8 and Romans 9. And plenty of other scriptures that will help you to understand what Jesus meant in John 3.16. So you've got to put all of that together to understand the complete picture. So the tabernacle is, just, is not just silver that's made into a foundation alone. It's not golden boards alone. It's not beautiful tapestries alone. And bringing redemption money alone does not tell the whole story of what it's all about. So the tabernacle is not a structure until you put all of the pieces together. Until you have all of it gathered together and erected, that's when it becomes the tabernacle. So what is it that Israel learned further about this redemption money and how that is applied and how it's accomplished? Well, they learned this, that redemption requires a substitute. It's not just that they bring the redemption money. There's also a substitute that's involved. No one can get close to the tabernacle without hearing this constant bleeding of the sheep, without the moos and the bullocks, without all the sounds of animals. And each of these animals keeps saying, substitute, substitute, substitute. Redemption is not accomplished without a substitute. Now the Israelites saw these animals killed on a daily basis, and they knew the animal sacrifice was for them. Because of their sins, because they had transgressed God's holy law, rather than them being killed because of it, there is an animal that takes their place. That's the substitute. Now perhaps the most beautiful picture of substitution in the Old Testament is the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Most of you or all of you are familiar with it. I, I happen to believe that Genesis 22 is one of the most moving stories in all of the Bible. That God told Abraham, take your son, take your only son Isaac, up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Now you know the story how Abraham and the lad went up on the mountain. Abraham put down the wood to burn the sacrifice. And they had no animal. And Isaac noticed there is no animal. So Abraham told Isaac that God would provide himself a lamb. And then he took the wood and he laid it down and he put Isaac on the wood. He put him on the altar and then he raised his hand to slit Isaac's throat. But then God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, don't harm him. Don't harm the child. And then Abraham turned around and looked and there was a ram that God had provided. There was a ram with his horns that were caught in the thicket. And that ram became the substitute for Isaac. And as you look at the tabernacle, what do you see? Well, as we go through this, as we study it, there we see ram skins dyed red. That makes up one of the coverings of the tabernacle. So you have all these thousands of rams that are killed as substitutes for the people of Israel. 
how the redemption of our eternal souls was not accomplished without a substitute. The Bible says in Hebrews, Hebrews 9, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made sin for us. And as I've explained that scripture many times, the original has this meaning. He was made a sin offering for us. So redemption is accomplished through a sacrifice. Now finally... Redemption requires satisfaction. Whatever offering is made, it must be satisfying to God. God must be satisfied. You know, that song that we sang just came to my mind. I mentioned uh, his robe is for mine. I asked you this morning, when, when did you last time that you saw propitiation in a song? We don't see that anymore. People don't think about that. But this is exactly what propitiation means, what it's about. God is satisfied. A propitiatory sacrifice is a sacrifice that satisfies. And God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. So the Israelite knows as he approaches the tabernacle that he can't come there unless the animal that he provides as a substitute is one that God will accept. It must be exactly as God requires. So just as redemption money must be the correct amount of uh, uh, submitted or specified, so a sacrifice that's made must be one that is pleasing to God. And so it was necessary that they very carefully inspect the sacrifices. Some people would be tempted to bring a sheep that was worthless. They might bring one that was diseased, one that was blind, perhaps one that's crippled and scrawny. I mean, after all, this is an animal that will die anyway, so why not bring the bad animals, not the good? But that's not acceptable to God. Only the very best was accepted. And there's a reason for that. And it's because the sacrifice must represent the sinless Son of God. It represents Jesus Christ of, of whom the Father said about Him, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God must be satisfied. And that brings us back to our earlier discussion. If God is pleased with the substitute, if He is satisfied with what the substitute accomplished, then how could any for whom that sacrifice is made be in hell? That would say that God is not satisfied. There's one huge mistake that people make when we talk about salvation. They have the idea that salvation is a contract between God and man. Salvation is not a contract between God and man. The contract is between God and God. You need to go read the entire 17th chapter of John to see it clearly. But let me just excerpt two verses of many that's in that chapter. Verse number 6 of John 17. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. In verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. When are these given to Christ, or were they given to Christ? Before the foundation of the world. Do you see what Jesus said? 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 confirms... But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. The Bible teaches that names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. So this means that the contract must be between God and His Son. The contract is between God the Father and His Son because this is done before any of us are born. So it can't be a contract between God and man. God agreed that the son's payment, if he makes this payment, that payment will be acceptable. And he's satisfied for this payment that's made for all time, or made in time, for all that were given to him before time. There's nothing that we could do to satisfy God. 
God did it all. Jesus paid it all. Now let me close with this thought. Our hope in Christ rests on sockets of silver. And of course, I mean that statement to be emblematic. The sockets of silver are made from redemption money. The hope of our salvation rests upon the redemption that is paid by Christ as surely as the tabernacle rests on that foundation of silver. The tabernacle can't stand unless there is a firm foundation. Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Another great old song we sing, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And then another song, we sang it, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. See, that silver that was paid, that is emblematic of Christ's blood, which is the only acceptable payment for sin. Now, this, this subject of redemption is not one that I can cover completely in the few minutes that we have tonight or and adding on to it what we had last time. There are 66 books of the Bible that all direct us in some way or another to the cross of Christ. If you preach the Bible, land your finger on just about any place that you want to, and somehow that passage is going to connect to Jesus Christ. You might struggle to find the connections at time, but that's where it's headed. It's all headed to what Jesus did. And so there are millions and millions of sermons that have been preached over the years about redemption. Still, there's no one who's exhausted the subject. The scope is broad. What Christ did for his people is beyond our comprehension. I can't explain to you all that Christ did, but I'm thankful that he did do it all. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Rohnert Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.